2011, Apple debuted Siri, a virtual assistant. Three years later, Amazon introduced the world to Alexa. Before that, we had the clapper. Do you remember the clapper? <laughs> clap on, clap off. That was early artificial intelligence, very artificial and not very intelligent. Siri and Alexa, the first versions could only do basic things. Now voice assistants are more refined and kind of part of our life. You might talk to Siri or Alexa or Bixby. Uh, many of you talk to your car uh, and it's designed for you to talk to it. I mean, I know you say stuff to your car, but it's designed to. I was kind of slow to adapt, but now I use Siri a lot. I say, hey Siri, call Cindy. And somehow, she knows that I want to call my wife, not the seven other Cindy's in my phone. Driving down the road, I don't even have to look at the phone. I say, hey, Siri, text Mary Grace. And Siri responds in her British accent, what do you want to say? And I dictate the text. Or I say, hey, Siri, remind me tomorrow at 9 a.m. that I need to clip my toenails. <laughs> Nine o'clock, Siri reminds me. Siri, tell me a dad joke. She does. Siri, what's 14 times 18? She gets it right every time. Siri can tell you what time a ball game starts, when it's going to rain. It can set a timer, play a song, or give you directions to the nearest Chick-fil-A. It's incredibly useful technology, helpful when it works, which is most of the time. We value technology that's helpful. If it saves you time, is simple to use, makes routine easier, it passes the test. We also value helpful people. Helpful people do what others don't see or notice. Helpful people don't always get the glory, but they get the job done. Helpful people clean up coffee spills in the lobby. They don't just watch me on my hands and knees, they get down and help me clean. Helpful people volunteer their time to better the lives of others. They are others focused, like the teams I talked about a few minutes ago that are visiting prisons. Helpful people look for ways to assist others, even strangers. This is something I've been working on when I travel because I have a tendency to kind of just get in my little zone and I'm only thinking about where I'm going and what I'm doing, bury my head in a book or listening to music and just doing my thing. So I've been trying to instead notice and help others. When someone looks lost or confused, I stop and ask if I can help. I have walked people who can't speak or read English to their next flight. I've given directions to people who are obviously lost and also obviously clueless if they're taking directions from me. Uh, I've carried luggage. I've carried babies. It's, it's just changed. It's even changed the way I leave hotel rooms. I used to not care what the room looked like. Now I pick up and throw away the trash. I put all the towels in a pile for the housekeeper. I straighten up. I want to be helpful. I want to make their job easier, not more difficult. And it's not that I haven't always been willing to help. It's just that I've neglected to intentionally notice people who need it. I've been doing my own thing. When your baby is crying on an airplane and you've got carry-on bags, you need someone who will help. When your tire is flat and you don't have a jack, you need help. When you're exhausted and there's still work to be done, you need help. When you're totally, completely lost, your cell phone is dead and you're horrible with directions, you need help. If you get injured or if you just had surgery and you can't take care of yourself, you need help. If I have you make a list of your favorite people, you will include those who are helpful, who make your life better and easier. Then there's the other side of that, that someone who's unhelpful and they don't help or improve the situation. They might even make it worse. They watch while you work. They don't follow instructions, add value or bring a smile to your face. You don't want unhelpful people on your team or in your inner circle. 
You, you quickly understand if someone is helpful or unhelpful. Helpful actions aren't accidental. They're intentional. It's easy to spot helpful actions. Helpful words can be a little different. It's easy to say something without thinking and not even realize the harm you cause or the hurt you create. Part one of this series, Pastor Randy introduced an acrostic, a simple way to remember five things you should consider before you speak. Most of you post or speak without thinking and just manage the consequences. Many of your most significant life mistakes would be avoided if you just think first. Be intentional in what you say. Is it true? Today we get a number two. Is it helpful? As a follower of Jesus, your words are supposed to represent him and demonstrate your faith. Your words should be helpful. Just like helpful actions, helpful words are intentional. If you are not intentionally helpful with your words, chances are that your words are often hurtful. So we look back to Ephesians chapter 4. Paul instructed the believers in Ephesus to live differently than the world around them. He opened the chapter by saying, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Paul continued that emphasis. Verse 22, he says, You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. And then right after challenging them to be like God in righteousness and holiness, Paul addressed the issue of their words. See, you can't separate your words, your talk, your speech, your posts from your faith. They're connected. Paul said, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building up others according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander, along with every form of malice, because that's unhelpful. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. Now I want to read verse 29 again, put the emphasis in a slightly different place. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. This is the Bible. I'm reading it straight. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Helpful words help. And it's not if you think it's helpful. That's not the standard. The biblical standard is, do they think it's helpful? When you are done speaking or posting, does the other person feel helped and built up according to their needs? Are they better because of time spent with you? Are you speaking for your benefit? You've got something to say and you, you just, you've got to say it. Or are you speaking for their benefit? There is something they need to hear and you're willing to say it. When someone excuses away hurtful words by saying, well, I was just trying to help, often what they mean is, don't evaluate me by what I say. Instead, examine my motive. The problem is, that's not what scripture says. The verse doesn't read only what you think is helpful. It says only what is helpful for building up others according to their needs. Now, you may not be aware, but there is an election coming up in our country. We're just about 50 days away. And I understand you have some strong opinions about politics. You got some frustrations with our culture and with society. Rightly so, I do too. But before you go on another rant, Ask yourself, what I'm about to say, will this point people to Jesus 
Or will this push people away from Jesus? Helpful words don't promote your opinion or your position. Instead, your words should create in people a hunger and a desire to know more about the Jesus you follow and serve. Helpful words promote and point people to Jesus. When you're done talking, people should say, there's something different about her. I want what she has. It's, it's incredible the way he responds to angry people. I don't know how he does it. I want to be like that. If that's what it means to be a Christian, count me in. Every time I'm around him, I, I leave feeling encouraged and built up. I want to make people feel that same way. People should say, wow, I don't agree with her at all. But I can tell she really loves Jesus and loves people. I cringe when I read some of the things you post on social media. Angry political opinions and horrible things about the people with whom you disagree. Rants about a restaurant or store or service person who did you wrong. Disappointment with your kids, teacher or school, forgetting that they're also humans. Complaints about minor inconveniences. Pointed judgments against people who are lost in sin. Thinly veiled, even open attacks on other Christians who you think are too soft on people who are lost in sin. I challenge you, read through your posts from the last three months and delete everything that doesn't accurately reflect the character and nature of Jesus. One of my friends did this last night. After I challenged him, he did it. And he emailed me this morning. He said, tonight's message was extremely powerful. I found myself guilty on all charges. Although I'm doing better, I still have a few areas where I really need to work. I went to Facebook and ministered deliverance to my page. I was surprised as I scrolled through a couple months worth of stuff that I only had to delete two things. That's a big improvement over last year when I would have had to delete a dozen things. I plan to stay vigilant and push people towards the cross, not away from it. You say, well, I think we need to take a stand. We need to let people know about sin and sinners. Followers of Jesus absolutely should stand for righteousness. But it is not your job to identify and condemn every wrong. It is not your assignment to make sure sinners know their actions are sinful. That's the Holy Spirit's job. John chapter 16, Jesus was speaking about the Holy Spirit and he described the role of the Holy Spirit. Here's what he said. I tell you the truth, it's for your good. He's talking to his disciples. It's for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the counselor, the Holy Spirit will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. In regards to sin, because men do not believe in me. In regards to righteousness, because I'm going to the Father where you can see me no longer. In regard to judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. When, when someone who's never really been to church doesn't know much about Jesus, they, they come to church and they just begin to weep. They're crying and they feel wrong about their sin, even though they don't really understand what that means. That is the Holy Spirit bringing what's called conviction. Conviction is an awareness of wrong. This is key. The Holy Spirit convicts of sin. That's his job, not ours. This is something Christians get wrong all too often. Since the Holy Spirit doesn't seem to work fast enough, you decide it's your job to be the convictor of sin. You need to let the world know everything they're doing wrong, and you do it with volume, all caps, and anger. The problem is, our feeble attempts to convict the world of sin only convinces them that we are judgmental and critical, and instead of pointing people to Jesus, we pull people away from Jesus. 
Now, I think sometimes those posts come from a genuine desire to help a lost world find Jesus. But you're trying to engage people in the wrong forum. You see, when Jesus confronted people about their sin, he met them where they were, in person. He looked into their eyes. He held their hands. He cried with them. He shared a meal. He listened to their stories. He washed their feet. It was personal, often dirty, uncomfortable. You cannot claim to act like Jesus when you sit in the comfort of relative anonymity and viciously blast the very people he came to earth and died for. If you search scripture, because people always say, well, Jesus was angry, you'll find the only people Jesus blasted were religious officials and teachers of law, church people, who should have recognized him but didn't. Social media is especially dangerous for Christians because it gives the illusion of having done something meaningful when in fact nothing meaningful at all has taken place. Decades of research and cognitive behavioral therapy have proven a person's core beliefs take incredible time and patience or a life-altering event to change. Your Facebook rant isn't going to get it done. Instead of posting, Here's my challenge. Get out there and act like Jesus. Meet sinners where they are. Look in their eyes. Hold their hands. Cry with them. Share a meal. Listen to their stories. Visit them in prison. Wash their feet. And once you've done all that, you'll be able to speak from a place of love like Jesus. Go where they are. And let your words promote and point people to Jesus. Trust that when people discover his love and grace, that their attitudes and behaviors will change. See, we got it backwards. We are focused on changing their attitude and behavior when all that is is a reflection of what's in their heart. If we will instead love them to Jesus, then it, when their heart changes, their attitude and their behaviors will change. Trust God's timing and God's process in people's life and trust that the Holy Spirit is fully capable of convicting of sin. Now let's look back at verse three, Ephesians four. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Helpful words promote unity and peace. They don't confuse, they don't divide. Instead, they bring people together. Before you speak, ask yourself, will this lead to greater unity in the church and in the body of Christ? Will this, what I'm about to say, lead to greater peace? Does this help build the kingdom? It's amazing the things people will say in church. When they're unhappy, they quickly turn self-centered and selfish. If someone makes a mistake that affects them, they're ready to write that person off or fire them from their ministry position. When their preferences are ignored, they loudly state their displeasure. And somewhere, sometime, they were taught this saying, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Now, if you're under 40, let me explain that. <laughs> that means the way to get what you want is to gripe, complain, and be negative. So I want you to know two things. Number one, that won't work here. It's not going to. We won't let the negative voice control the agenda. You will not get your way by being angry and divisive. I promise. Number two, when your words bring division, you're not helpful. You're not promoting unity and peace. And you're not obeying God's command. Now, hear me close. Because I get misquoted. I am not saying that your opinion doesn't matter. We make mistakes. I make a lot of mistakes. I, I have I told our team the other day, no one has more bad ideas than me. I lead the team in bad ideas. You have lived through many of my bad ideas. We make mistakes. We miss things that need to be pointed out. But that can be done in a way that promotes unity and peace. If you can't say it with gentle love, it's not the right time to say it. Here's, here's one of the prayers that I often pray. Psalm 1914, may the words of my mouth 
and the meditation of my heart, meditation of my heart is, is my thinking, my attitude. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord. You say, well, I don't swear. I don't use profanity. I don't tell dirty jokes. I don't lie. Oh, that's good. I'm proud of you. But that's not the standard. The question is, are your words and the attitudes behind them pleasing to Jesus? Helpful words please Jesus. So before you speak, ask yourself, will this please Jesus? Now, I read the passage earlier, and when I did, I left out the verse that follows it. So in light of everything we've talked about it, I want to read it again. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what's helpful for building up others according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. When your words are not helpful, when they do not produce unity and peace, when they don't benefit those who listen, not only do you cause division and confusion, you grieve the Spirit of God. The message says it this way, don't grieve God, don't break his heart. His Holy Spirit moving and breathing you is the most intimate part of your life, making you fit for himself. Don't take such a gift for granted. When Parker and Tyler were little, they fought and argued. Don't they look just perfect there? <laughs> of course, in a pastor's home, you know they were perfect children, always loving each other, just saying good, helpful things. They fought all the time. When Tyler was bigger than Parker, he would sit on his chest and hit him and yell at him. And then Parker got bigger than Tyler and everything changed. One day, they were really going at it, and it was, I was a little ticked off. But before I could break it up, I realized how mean they were. And I thought, who are these kids? And who are their horrible parents? How can two brothers who are supposed to love each other be so awful to each other? Because I love them both so much, their cut downs to each other hurt me as if they were directed to me. I'm afraid it's a lot like that when the Lord hears us tearing each other down. It grieves his heart. And when I started out with this message, my plan was to talk about all the kinds of things that are unhelpful, but I finally realized there's, there's no way to identify them all. Instead, the question is, do your words help and benefit others or do your words break the heart of God? What you say, what you post, does it help and benefit others? If it doesn't, it breaks the heart of God. I want to read the verse one more time, put the emphasis in yet another place, and now it gets really tough. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building up others according to their needs, that it may benefit Oh, not just them, but those who listen. It's not just the people you talk to need to be helped and built up. Your words should benefit all who listen. So who's listening? Your unsaved family members? Your kids? Your grandkids? The people who look up to you as a senior saint, your neighbors, your coworkers, your teachers, other students, people you've invited to church, people who know you are a Christian, and people who don't know you're a Christian. They are all listening. And according to the Bible, your words are supposed to benefit all of them. That's what Scripture says. They're your words should benefit, should add value to, should help everyone who's listening. You might say a lot less. 
And there's a lot riding on this. We live in an angry, opinionated, offended world where people hurl their words without thought. They hurt others, often unintentionally, but other times on purpose with the words they say. Listen to me, we must be different. And when we are, we will stand out. There are people around you who need Jesus. You see them at school, at work, in your neighborhood, in your family, even in your home. Are your words pointing them to Jesus? Or are your words pulling them from Jesus? Mary Grace and Lucas are gonna sing a song and the words of this song are a beautiful way to pray. Would you pray along with them as they sing this? Make me wise to walk this earth And gentle like your father Joyful like a child secure And make me brave to speak your words Give faith that beckons miracles Make me pure and holy yours I wanna be like you I wanna be like you Chances for your kingdom. I choose to say, spend my life with it. I want to be like you. I want to be like you. And I only want to be found faithful. Lord, make us able to represent you.
bow your heads with me? I want to pray for you. I want to pray that your words will point people to Jesus and that instead of being accidentally hurtful, they will be intentionally helpful. Lord, we give you our words. We recognize that we can't separate them from our faith or from our relationship with you, but that we are accountable to you for every word spoken. Lord, I pray that our words would be helpful, not just for the person we say them to, but for everyone who listens, that we would point them to you and to relationship with you. Lord, forgive us because we have a lot of opinions and we have an alarming tendency to elevate our opinions without thinking about the results of that. Lord, not just the words we speak, but the what we post. Let it represent you and draw people to you. Build unity and bring peace, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.